Hello students, and good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, depending on when you are joining us for this, our second lecture bite from week seven of History 126, The History of Human Rights in Europe. I, Parawis, am Professor Adam Zentek, your instructor for this course. In our last lecture bite, we considered the First World War, and I made one main argument rather than spending a lot of time on it. Uh, if you're interested in the First World War from the French point of view, you could take my class, History 141, Modern France, or you could take the class we offer in the History Department on the First World War specifically. Now the war, the argument that I made, the simple argument, was not conducted according to the laws of war that existed at the time. And, and indeed, belligerents seemed almost to be in a race to violate these laws as soon as the technology of destruction allowed a certain level of sophistication and lethality, it was inevitably deployed. The laws of war turned out to be mere parchment barriers. This is because, as Clausewitz tells us, war escalates, the violence escalates. It's an indigenous property to war as a social activity. In this lecture bite, we will consider the Armenian genocide. Genocide is, of course, the ultimate violation of human rights, the, the, depriving people not just of their rights to life, liberty, and property, but depriving their community of its historical identity and existence, of physically annihilating people, but also destroying culture. Genocide is arguably also the defining fact of Western history in the first half of the 20th century, a time when the concentration camp or extermination camp could serve as a symbol of European culture. So who are the Armenians? The Armenians are an ethnic group that have, for somewhere around 2,000 years or so, inhabited an eastern region in Anatolia, which is also, another name for that is Asia Minor. The heart of historical Armenia is a mountainous plateau in the eastern region of Anatolia. It's about the size of Indiana. And for much of its early history, Armenia was under the cultural influence of the Persian Empire but the Armenian people were the very first to convert en masse to Christianity. They converted even before the Romans did. And subsequently, they turned their cultural attention to the Mediterranean, to the Hellenistic world. Western Armenia was integrated into the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, and Eastern Armenia remained under Iranian, then in the 19th century, Russian control. And a point of vocabulary, from the 19th century onward, Western Armenians are generally known as Armenians, whereas the Eastern Armenians, who ended up on the Russian side of the border, are known as Russian Armenians. Under the Ottomans, Armenians went generally unmolested, although they were officially discriminated against in Ottoman civil society and had to pay a special tax. The historical territory of Armenia was multi-ethnic, while the Armenian ethnicity dominated there in these six Eastern vilayets of the Ottoman Empire. These regions also had significant Kurdish populations, the, the Kurds called Armenia Kurdistan. It also, they also had Arab populations and, of course, Turks. Moreover, many Armenians, in particular the intellectual and commercial elite of the Armenian people, lived in port towns along the Black Sea and along the Aegean. For much of its history, the Ottoman Empire was rather generous to its ethnic minorities, generous at least by European standards. And it had to be, for Christians, Kurds, and Arabs outnumbered the ruling Turks quite substantially. Which is to say the Turks were a minority, a ruling minority in their own empire. And up to the last third of the 19th century, in general, the Armenians prospered under Ottoman rule. One historian, Ronald Sunni, has characterized this period of Ottoman rule as, quote, a benign symbiosis. The tolerance towards the Armenians began to change in the late 19th century, with the decline of Ottoman power and the fears this produced in the Ottoman ruling class. Of particular note here was the year 1878, the year of the Berlin Treaty, which ended a minor conflict, the Russo-Turkish War. Russia won the war handily, and the major result was that the Ottoman Empire lost a substantial portion of its European territory. And, the Berlin Treaty, and so the Berlin Treaty created a new set of Christian states in what was formerly Ottoman, Bulgaria, Romania, Montenegro, and Serbia. After 1878, the attitude of Ottoman authorities towards Christian minorities changed from one of tolerance to one of intolerance, particularly towards the three major Christian communities that remained, the Armenians, 
the Greeks, and the Assyrians, or the Syriacs. And by the, by the 1890s, the Ottoman Empire had lost an enormous amount of power and prestige vis-a-vis -vis the liberal, capitalist nation-states of Europe, and was generally considered to be a second-rate power, called, quote, the sick man of Europe. Now, with this decline came a newfound desire among the ruling class to purify the interior of the Ottoman Empire of potential internal enemies and traitors, to fortify the Anatolian homeland in particular against the sure-to-come dismemberment of the empire. The Ottomans, put another way, feared the encroachment of Christian Europe, and feared too that this nationalism was spreading among the Ottoman Empire's component peoples, particularly among the Christian Armenians, who had, of course, their own nation, their own imagined community within Ottoman lands, with their own history, their own religion, their own language, their own writing script, and their own culture. The Armenians then emerged as the leading suspects as internal enemies, for they were the most prominent and unified minority in the Ottoman Empire. There were a few predicate events to the Armenian Genocide that you need to know about in order to understand why it happened, and I'd like to go through those now. Those were the Hamidian Massacres of 1894-1896, to 1896, the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913, the ethnic cleansing of the Greeks, which began in late 1913 into 1914 and picked up during the war, and the February 1914 Accord with Russia, which was designed to protect the Armenians. So let's consider these all briefly in turn. The ruler of the Ottoman Empire from 1876 onward, which is to say just two years before the Treaty of Berlin and the dismemberment of the Balkan holdings of the Ottomans, and he was on, on the throne until 1909 when he was overthrown, he was named Abdul Hamid II, or simply Abdul Hamid. In the face of Ottoman decline, Abdul Hamid adopted a policy of what was called pan-Islamism, which replaced the tolerance of the empire with an ideology that elevated Muslims above Christian, Christians and Jews, and placed Abdul Hamid himself at the head of an ostensibly worldwide Islamic caliphate. Part of this was the formation of what were called Hamidian regiments, made up primarily of Muslim Kurds and Circassians, which is what the Ottomans called Russian Muslims who were refugees and settled in Anatolia. Hamidian regiments were used to keep order in the geographically roughed southeast and east of Anatolia, and in particular in regions with large Armenian populations. These Hamidian units and the politicians who told them what to do were deeply suspicious of Armenians, whom the Ottomans feared always were preparing a nationalist rebellion, a revolution. Throughout 1894, the Hamidian regiments routinely raided Armenian shops and churches, looking for weapons and evidence of rebellion, which only served to drive distrust and even hatred of the Ottomans among the Armenians. The violence spread in 1895, with clashes occurring in all the cities with major Armenian populations, most always with the local Muslim population joining in the violence, the looting, and the killing. This happened in Istanbul itself in September of 1895. After an Armenian protest regarding their community's treatment, Armenian shops were smashed and hundreds of Armenians murdered in the streets. One American observer who witnessed such violence in the city of Marsavan described it like this. I saw our neighbors running out to join the mob, each with a gun or a sword in his hands. A little later, I heard shots come, ping, 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 against the walls of the little room where we stood together looking out. Through a crack in our gates, I saw a woman lying in the streets, slashed and hacked, and just at the point of death. The Armenian shops in the market, where the Armenians were the shopkeeping class in a city of about 25,000 or more people, were virtually all picked clean as a bone. Armenians in the number of about 125 were killed. The government was in full control throughout. The killings were worst in the city of Diyarbakir, the center of a huge province with a large Armenian population, where thousands were killed over the course of three days that began on November 1st, 1895. During these pogroms, for that's what they were, hundreds of Armenian women were simply kidnapped from their homes and made into slaves. And the French representative in the city at the time wrote back to Paris, quote, The city is engulfed in fire and blood. Save us. All in all, between 100,000 and 300,000 Armenians, in, in, in an obvious violation of the spirit of international law, were killed by the Hamidian regiments between 1894 and 1897. But nobody knows the true number. 
This introduced what historian Ronald Sunni has called a, quote, effective veil between the Ottoman and Armenian communities. The Ottomans were convinced that the Armenians remained always again on the verge of a rebellion, whereas the Armenians became convinced that they could never be safe under Ottoman rule. As of 1895 or so, Sunni writes, almost any spark could set off a massacre. Now, the years between 1896 and 1908, 1909 were not particularly good for Abdul Hamid, who faced rebellions among the Macedonians and Thracians, continued anti-Ottoman sentiments among the Armenians, many of whom became at this point dedicated revolutionaries, and the Muslim resistance to his rule in the form of the Young Turks movement, which was formally called the Committee on Union and Progress, or CUP. The CUP wanted to reverse the Islamization of the empire and create from it a secular, modern Turkish state. They wanted to get rid of the old multi-ethnic, multinational conglomerate. Then in 1908, the Young Turks organized a military mutiny that threatened Abdul Hamid's control of the empire, and he reluctantly agreed to some reforms, in particular the creation of an Ottoman parliament and some restrictions of his own powers. He was then, in 1909, deposed completely, and the Young Turks took power. The CUP had power for the next half decade, but the Young Turks were themselves divided as to how to treat the minority nationalities of the empire, with some hoping for a purified ethno-nationalist Turkish state, and others seeing a kind of multiculturalism as the way forward. After a pro-Abdul Hamid uprising in 1909, the Young Turks turned to an increasingly authoritarian form of ethno-nationalism that was characterized by anti-Armenian and anti-Greek sentiments. For, for there were hundreds of thousands of ethnic Greeks who lived in the coastal regions of Anatolia, al along the port cities of the, the Aegean and the Black Sea. Now, this was the context in which the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913 broke out. Because in 1912, the Ottomans still controlled a relatively large portion of the Balkans in what is today Kosovo, Albania, Macedonia, and Bulgaria. But sensing the weakness of the Ottomans, Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, and Montenegro formed a military alliance, the so-called Balkan League, which was strongly supported by Russia and secretly supported by Germany. The Balkan League sought to liberate the Christian nationalities of the Ottoman Empire and integrate them into their own nations. On October 8, 1912, the Balkan League attacked the European territories of the Ottomans, starting the First Balkan War. The military history of the war is unexciting for our purposes. What mattered was that the Ottomans were trounced when the war ended in May of 1913, losing the vast majority of their European territory. There was then another Balkan War, this one from June to August of 1913. Here it was the Bulgarians against the former members of the Balkan League and the Ottomans. And the Ottomans were successful in taking back some of the territory that they had in the Balkans, but not all of it, not nearly all of it. These wars were ethnically vicious, as each belligerent believed it was liberating national territory from the domination of a racial other, and they were characterized by the frequent brutal treatment of non-combatants and prisoners of war. Uh, the Balkan Wars had three results. You could see on this map here the way that, that, that the Balkan Wars shook out. And in, in the, the brown, obviously, is the Ottoman Empire. Green is Bulgaria. Red is Serbia. This kind of uh, olive color is, is Montenegro. And, and blue is Greece. And what you could see is that Bulgaria roughly doubled its size in the First Balkan War. Serbia more than doubled its size. And Greece basically doubled its size, grabbing all this land from the Ottomans, who were pushed all the way to Adrianople, in the First Balkan War. Istanbul was, was under threat. In, in the Second Balkan War, you could see what the, the uh, Ottomans took back, this small portion spreading from Adrianople out. Now, this, the, the loss of this territory served to emphasize how weak the Ottoman Empire had become. And not only that, these were the richest parts of the Ottoman Empire. And so the loss of these territories was financially disastrous. The young Turks began to see the Ottomans as engaged in and losing something like a Darwinian struggle for survival. Second, the Ottomans became convinced that the remaining Christian minorities in their empire simply could not be trusted. Indeed, only Sunni Muslims, which is to say Turks, Kurds, Arabs, and Circassians, could be relied upon. Quote, 
the theme of revenge, the urge to set right the wrongs that had been done against Muslims and Turks, ran through the memories of those who suffered through the Balkan Wars, writes Sunni. Third, a massive influx of Muslim refugees from those Balkan lands flooded into Anatolia, filling towns and cities. There was a question, where could all these people go? Hundreds of thousands. And so the situation of the two largest remaining Christian minorities, the Greeks in the West and the Armenians in the East of Anatolia, grew much worse. According to Dr. Nazem Bey, the pretensions of the various nationalities are a capital source of annoyance for us. We hold linguistic, historical, and ethnic aspirations in abhorrence. This and that group will have to disappear. There should be only one nation on our soil, the Ottoman nation, and only one language, Turkish. Such was the position of Ottoman political elites after the Balkan Wars, and of the three most powerful of the young Turks, Pasha's Talat, Enver, and Kemal, whom you can see here. From 1913 onward, this triumvirate, as they were called, governed the Ottoman Empire as a single-party Turkish nationalist, racist, and authoritarian state. This was what they believed they needed to do in order to assure that Turkey could survive. This is what they thought they needed to do in order to ensure that a Turkish state could survive the depredations of Christian Europe. Now, the Ottoman Empire was not actually part of the alliance system that, that was behind the, the general European war, the Great War of 1914 to 1918. So the young Turks calculated that the survival of their empire required an alliance with one or the other bloc, as well as a total militarization of Ottoman society. This is because war, the young Turks thought, might actually be a solution to the problems that were plaguing the empire. And because they were free to join either side, they had a war of choice. They had some uh, room for, for deliberation and action. In the end, the young Turks reasoned that the main strategic threat the Ottomans faced was from the pan-Slavist Russian Empire, which had always wanted, and still wants, of course, control of Istanbul and the Bosphorus Straits. As Talat Pasha declared, Russia is our greatest enemy, and we are afraid of her. If now, while Germany is attacking Russia, we can give her a good strong kick, and so make her powerless to injure us for some time, it is Turkey's duty to administer that kick. The Ottoman Empire thus joined the war on the side of, of the Austro-Hungarians and Germans in October of 1914. For the young Turks, writes the historian Sunni, quote, the war was conceived of as a transformative, revolutionary opportunity, a moment to gamble in order to save the empire and make it more secure. Now this would turn out to be, of course, a world historical disaster for, for the Ottomans. It, the, second, the, the First World War cost the Ottomans almost a million soldiers killed in action and some 4 million non-combatants killed, which is something like a fifth of the population of the empire, meaning that the Ottoman Empire suffered proportionally vastly greater casualties, uh, vastly greater civilian casualties, than, than any other of the major belligerents. These casualties include, of course, as we'll see, about a million and a half Armenians. But of course, before they lost the war, uh, the, the, the young Turks thought that they would win it. If the Ottomans were to be successful in a general European war, they would first, the young Turks believed, need to deal with the potentially treacherous Christian communities that remained in the interior of the empire, namely the Aegean and Pontic Greeks and the Anatolian Ar Armenians. Both groups represented potential fifth columns in the Ottoman heartlands that might rise up and cause trouble. Although we must note that the historical evidence that's available to us now, and, and, and there's no reason to think that this historical evidence is not, is not, does not give a complete picture of what was going on, there's no evidence whatsoever that the Armenians or Greeks were, were planning some kind of uprising or rebellion. It was completely made up. It was a conspiracy theory. In other words, Turkish racial and national paranoia, stemming from Ottoman weakness, allowed the Turks to blame the Armenians and the Greeks for the insecurity of their empire. The Greeks were the first target. They were targeted even before the, way, the war began as a kind of ethnic preparation. Close to three quarters of a million ethnic Greeks lived along the Aegean, and this was, from 1914 onward, taken to be an unacceptable security risk. Already, in early 1914, the Ottomans had begun forcibly expelling ethnic Greeks from the Aegean and sending them to Greece itself. Now, this ethnic cleansing took place along 
what the great historian Tanner Occam has called a dual track mechanism. And I'd like to explain what that means. On the one hand, there was the planning, demographic planning among the high Turk elites, which was influenced by, again, racial theories. They established what Occam calls the 5 to 10% rule, which held that in no city in Ottoman lands could the Greeks make up more than 5 to 10% of the population. And this meant that in the Greek towns along the Aegean, which were ma majority Greek, the majority of the population would have to be physically removed and resettled elsewhere. Only this, the young Turks believed, could protect Western Anatolia from this ostensibly treacherous minority that was waiting to rise up. A similar logic underlay the expulsion of the Pontic Greeks from the shores of the Black Sea, which you can, you can see where they are in this map that I've provided in the north. This track of the mechanism was cool, rational. It was a form of human accounting, of moving populations around to achieve the ideal ethnic composition of the empire. It was a form of social engineering. But on the other hand was the way that these population transfers were actually affected. They relied on outright terror, mass murder, and torture. In early 1914, for instance, thousands of Greeks were simply slaughtered. That's what encouraged tens of thousands of them to flee to Christian Europe, and in particular to Greece itself as refugees. Now, during the war, this ethnic cleansing campaign was stepped up by an order of magnitude. Of the million or so Greeks in total in the Ottoman lands in 1914, a year later, about 100,000 of them had been driven out of the empire by force. About 165,000 of them had left the empire and emigrated to Greece voluntarily. And more than 200,000 made refugees, either international or internal, meaning half the Greek population had been cleansed, so to speak, from the Ottoman lands. By this continued through 1916, 1917, and even after the war, up until 1922, when virtually every Greek in Anatolia had been either killed or had fled. The number of people killed between 1915 and 1922 is somewhere around 400,000. What's up? Uh, I got an email from this teacher. Yeah? Apparently he's been crying off and on all morning and refused the snack, but they're going to go outside. And okay. The fresh air is going to help. Okay. <laughs> it's my son's first day at preschool. There was an economic element to all this as well, as Greek Christians tended to be better off than their Muslim and Turkish neighbors. Greek shops and homes were not only vandalized, but physically repossessed and given to ethnic Turks, who were themselves refugees from the Balkans. In other words, uh, the Muslim refugees from, from the, the Balkan Wars of 1913, uh, 1912 and 1913 were just resettled in the very houses. Nowhere was the population by the end of 1922 anywhere more than 5% Greek, not even close. And by these standards, by the Turks' own standard, the demographic program worked. It must be said, though, that the Greeks had somewhere to go, and some had the ability to get there. There was an independent nation, an independent Greece that could advocate and fight for them. All these things made the ethnic cleansing campaign much less bad than it could have been as hard as that is to believe. Not so for the Armenians, who lived far from the sea and had no country of their own to which to flee as refugees, and, and, and moreover, no country in the world who would even take them as refugees. They were stuck, in other words, in the Anatolian interior, and, and, and their situation was dire. And so in February of 19, in 1914, before the war began, in recognition of the Armenians' dire predicament, the great powers of Europe, and in particular Russia, forced the Ottomans, under threat of sanction and force, to agree to a set of international humanitarian reforms that were designed to protect the Armenian minority population. In particular, observers from the Western powers would be placed in the six Eastern Vilayets, as, as Ottoman provinces were called, with large Armenian populations. Again, the regime was forced upon the Young Turks by the European powers in February of 1914. This only served to heighten the tension between the Armenians and the Turks. Now, of course, once the Ottomans joined the war on the side of the Germans and Austrians in October of 1914, this observation, this humanitarian regime designed to protect the Armenians, fell apart and, and the observers were all expelled. This left the Armenians without any kind of protection other than a faint hope of a Russian victory that would liberate their homeland. 
Now, in their treatment of the Greeks, the Young Turks had already shown that they considered the war an opportunity to remake the demographics of the empire. And so the war also provided an opportunity to solve, once and for all, the so-called Armenian question. The Young Turks decided to pursue a similar demographic solution to the Armenian question as they did to solve the Greek question, which was to reduce the Armenian population everywhere in the empire to no more than 5 to 10 percent. Now, there were about 1.8 million Armenians in the empire all told, which came to something like 8% of the population. But again, they were concentrated in these six eastern vilayets, where they made up much, much more than 5% of the population, where they made up the majority. The question then became where to settle the excess Armenians in other parts of the Ottoman lands. They were not wanted in western Anatolia, where, where they were hated. They were not allowed, obviously, to stay where they were. They had to be dispersed. The only place to put them was in the south, towards Syria, towards the desert. But, as Tanim Acker has shown, there was a problem, because the Vilayets in Syria, in the desert, were sparsely populated. So an influx of Armenians would make the Armenians the majority there. They would outnumber the Arabs who lived in these desert cities. This, of course, would de defeat the entire point. And so the Young Turks ran what was essentially a ghastly type of math. Only if they reduced the total Armenian population by a factor of 10 could the demographic and strategic goals of population transfer be met. They concluded then that they needed to physically annihilate, which is to say they needed to murder around one and a half million Armenians. And this is exactly what they did. At this point, the dual track system was activated once again. In the level of high politics and policy, the Armenians were barely discussed publicly, with the Young Turks talking about Armenians when they talked about them in terms of euphemism, terms about resettlement. On the ground, agents went out to the regional capitals with secret verbal instructions that were only relayed personally, so as to not leave an extensive paper trail. A secret paramilitary force called the Special Organization, which was under the command of doctors Sakir and Nazem, was organized, and it was staffed, at least partially, with violent maniacs from Ottoman prisons and religious fanatics from the Kurdish regions. The special organization was then given the task of systematically locating and rounding up Armenians throughout the east and driving them on marches, on foot, to concentration camps in the Syrian desert. The purpose, again, was not to resettle them, but to resettle only around 100,000 or so. Those who were not killed in the roundups directly those who did not die in the march through the Anatolian highlands and into the desert, they would be killed when they arrived, left to die or murdered in the camps themselves. Now, a key chronological turning point in the history of the Armenian Genocide was the Battle of Sarakamish, which took place between December and January of 1915 in the eastern Anatolian Caucasus Mountains. The battle involved some 80,000 Russians and Russian-Armenian volunteers, and around 10,000 or so Ottomans. Now, at first, the Ottomans did well, and they drove the Russians back, but they were unprepared for the awful weather, and they fought with outdated tactics from the Napoleonic era. The battle ended in a catastrophic Ottoman defeat, with the Ottoman army losing nearly half its strength, with more than half of these casualties, more than 20,000 men, killed in action. The Russians lost around 1,600 in total. Panic then overtook Istanbul. Up until Sarakamish, there was, of course, random and sporadic ethnic violence in the Armenian areas, especially in the border regions where there was a large military presence, with the Ottomans harassing Armenians and the Russians harassing Muslims wherever they were stationed. But the violence remained random and sporadic. It was only after Sarakamish that it became systematic. As Sunni notes, the loss of Sarakamish caused, quote, political despair, panic, and a search for vengeance. It also meant that random ethnic violence almost immediately mutated into an organized genocidal campaign of racial annihilation. Somewhere around late February or early March, the Young Turks made the fateful decision to begin deporting all the Armenians in Anatolia to the Syrian desert. The key Ottoman figure here was Dr. Bayhadeen Sakir, the head of the Teskaladi Mahusa, the secret special organization behind the ethnic cleansing of the Greeks, and the second part 
the muscle on the ground of the dual track system. Sakir was a Turkish nationalist and, and died in the wool racist, who, according to Akam, sent a letter on March 3, 1915, that contained these lines. The young Turks, who cannot forget the country's bitter and unhappy history, and whose cup runneth over with the unrelenting desire for revenge, have decided to annihilate all of the Armenians living within Turkey, not to allow a single one to remain, and has given the government broad authority in this regard. On the question of how this killing and massacring will be carried out, the central government will give the necessary instructions to the provincial governors and army commanders. All of the unionist regional representatives would concern themselves with following up on this matter in all the places where Armenians were found, and would ensure that not a single Armenian would receive protection or assistance. The genocidal campaign first affected Armenians who had been conscripted into the Ottoman armies, most of whom served in labor battalions behind the lines. They were simply taken out in small groups and shot or bayoneted by the new version of the Hamidian Irregulars. The deportations of civilians started in mid-March, and in particular at first around the city of Zaitun in southeastern Anatolia, where 2,200 Armenians were rounded up and sent to the city of Konya, which began as a transit hub for the genocidal deportations and came to resemble the giant concentration camp that it truly was. By the end of April, not a single Armenian remained in Zaitun, and Muslims from Bosnia had repopulated the town, moving into the shops and homes, wearing the Armenians' clothes, sleeping in their beds. The next city to be targeted was the ancient fortress of Van, which was not founded by Armenians, but was an Armenian-majority city. The man in charge of destroying the Armenian community there, a certain Sevdet, formed what he called butchers' battalions, consisting of Kurdish raiders and Turkish convicts, and simply set them loose on the city, where they systematically murdered men and abducted women and children. Their orders write from Sakir, quote, exterminate all Armenian males of 12 years age and over. Half the Armenian population of the city was butchered. When the Russians entered the city again, after the Ottomans were forced to treat from it in May 1915, the first units to arrive were Armenian volunteers who found their, 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 their countrymen uh, massacred in the streets. The Russians gave the Armenian volunteers wide privilege to enact reprisals on the Muslims who had moved into their homes and remained in the region, of which they availed themselves. But the fortunes of war changed again, and in July 1915, the Russians were forced to retreat from the city and the entire remaining Armenian population fled as refugees into the Russian caucus. And so in the city of Van too, there were no more Armenians. By the summer of 1915, arrests and deportations of Armenians were taking place across Armenian Anatolia. Only now they weren't being sent to Konya in central Anatolia, but to Urfa, Razalan, and Deir el-Zor, cities in the Syrian desert. There, again, they were supposed to be resettled so as to make up at most one-tenth of the population of any given town. And the rule was no more than 50 Armenian households could ever concentrate in one city. No Armenian schools would be allowed, only Turkish schools. The, the Armenian language would be discouraged or eliminated. Only Turkish would be used. Now the young Turk power elite discussed the deportations and murders in terms of demographics, asking their governors and generals of how many Armenians lived here or there how many had been removed, which provides, if you only read these sources, a kind of antiseptic view of what actually happened on the ground. For people were not removed with care. They were tortured, raped, enslaved, and forced into the deserts to die. One British vice consul reported about the city of Diyarbakir, whose Armenian community was destroyed in the summer of 1915. They drove red-hot horseshoes in the breast of a friend and his associates. They forced some others to put their heads under big presses, and then by turning the handles, crushed their heads to pieces. Others they mutilated or pulled out their nails with pincers. Others were skinned alive. The orders that the soldiers who did the killing received were very terse and very harsh. They were yar vur oldir, burn, demolish, and kill. There were some voices of protest in Europe, but not many, and the young Turks simply denied that any of this was taking place. 
Between May and November of 1915, nearly all Armenians in eastern Anatolia were forcibly driven from their homes. Usually the men over the age of 12, as we saw, were simply killed, buried in mass graves or left on the side of roads or in the streets of the city. Women and children were marched on foot to the southeastern deserts. Some of these women and children on their route were abducted and forced to convert to Islam, or enslaved, or even forced to marry the very Kurdish irregulars who had murdered their husbands. The sick were, of course, left behind to die. The, the point, after all, was not really to displace or relocate the Armenians, but to kill and annihilate them, to destroy the entire historical Armenian nation. Have the Armenians who have been dispatched from the town been liquidated? Have those detrimental and dangerous persons been exterminated? Or have they simply been sent off into exile somewhere else? Talit Pasha demanded of one regional commander when the town of Harput was evacuated of its Armenians. This was typical of the language that they employed when they thought that nobody else would hear it. Annihilate, exterminate, destroy. And so in 1915, when the Armenian women and children reached the outskirts of the Syrian desert, they were placed in concentration camps in the Aleppo region, where many of them died from starvation, thirst, abuse, illness, or neglect. The camps followed the Euphrates River down to the desert city of Deir el-Zor in what is now eastern Syria. This city was most recently in the news because it was destroyed by ISIS in 2014. In the historical memory of the, the Armenians, Deir el-Zor plays a role analogous to the role played by Auschwitz in the historical memory of Europe's Jews. It, it was the final destination. For the young Turks then, the problem was that too many Armenians were surviving this journey to Deir el-Zor. While hundreds of thousands were murdered outright during the transit, hundreds of thousands still survived, something like 300,000. This meant that more killing had to take place at the end should the 5-10% to 10 demographic rule be followed. And for the most part, the Ottomans allowed nature to do its work on the Armenians, sometimes simply by denying them food and water, and at other times literally driving them into the desert and leaving them there to die. And Amer one American observer at the time noted that of the nearly 300,000 Armenians who arrived at Deir el-Zor over the course of 1915 and early 1916, there were only 12,000 left alive by September of 1916. And this, quite shockingly, made this region of the Ottoman Empire the most Armenian region of all. In total, about 100 to 150,000 Armenians were left alive out of the 1.5 or 1.8 million who were alive and thriving just two years earlier. This was the 5 to 10% rule applied literally in action. This was the 5 to 10% rule in action and, and applied literally. And the survivors, if they were young, at least many of them, were forced to convert to Islam and adopt Turkish culture, either by marrying a Muslim in the case of women or by being literally adopted into a Muslim family in the case of children. Now, the, the Turkish government, of course, has denied that any of this ever took place. At, at least they've denied it took place in the way it did. The Turks' argument essentially boils down to this that between 1914 and 1922, it was a really tough time in, in the Ottoman Empire. Anatolia was under attack from within and without. And lots of people, lots of people got killed on all the different sides. Now, this is true as far as it goes, but it is not an explanation for the genocide process. And as I've tried to suggest throughout this lecture, genocide is not an event, it's not a moment in time, but a historical process. The Ottoman state clearly and deliberately set out to destroy not just Armenian people, but the Armenian nation and its historical memory. The goal of the genocide was not just to kill people in the present, but to erase people, erase Armenia from the past, and to assure that there could not possibly be an Armenia in the future. So, how to explain all this? Now, now I have a couple of ideas that have to do with nationalism, racism, panic and fear during times of war and exception, and conspiracy theories. But I'd like to hear what you have to say. And so this will be one of the topics that we discuss in our live section this week. And keep that question, how could this happen, in mind as you watch the rest of the lecture bites for this week.